covering chapter 16, which is diagnostic imaging. Uh, we're not going to cover the entire lecture. I do have 60 slides here for you, but I'm only going to cover the first 30 um, as an introduction. You're going to get some more information about diagnostic imaging um, throughout this program. It is important that you pay attention to these basics, however, because without them, you're not going to understand the rest. So we're going to talk about x-ray production and equipment. Um, you should also be watching the x-ray safety uh, lecture, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, how to stay safe um, within the x-ray room. So within that x-ray safety um, uh, lecture, I, I give you a brief um, example of why it's important uh, to know how to produce the right image the, right, the first time. And so we're going to talk about how to do that here. So what are x-rays? X-rays are non-luminous, so they're not light. You can't see them. Electromagnetic radiation similar to visible light and radio and television signals, but they have shorter wavelengths. The shorter the wavelengths, the greater the energy, the greater the penetration of the x-ray beam. Because they're short wavelengths, they're ultra short, those x-rays are not visible. When we're talking about diagnostic x-rays, um, we have to talk about how we make the, the x-rays, where they come from, why we do it that way, and what they do. So the x-ray tube is the source of the x-rays. It has an anode, which in this case, an anode is considered positive, and the cathode is considered negative. You might see that different in chemistry. But it, with this uh, light and this electricity, we have the anode as positive and the cathode is negative. So I need you to remember that this is different from some of your chemical lectures. The, this anode and cathode are enclosed in a vacuum surrounded by a lead housing. Now, if you've looked at the radiation safety lecture, you know that lead, that um, x-rays do not go through lead or cannot penetrate very far through lead. They go a little bit through lead, but not very far. Um, so that lead housing, along, you know, it's thick lead housing. It's very heavy along with within that um, housing produced. We have filaments in that cathode, which are negative. They're heated up, but they don't melt. And we have to have a very specific metal, and let you think about what that metal is, because you stay curious, because that metal is really important. That type of metal is important. We need to have it heat up to a certain amount, but not melt. So it will, what it will do is it create those electrons, will boil off and form a cloud within the focusing cup. The electrons are accelerated across that vacuum and crash into a target on the anode, on the positive side. So negative electrons bouncing off and crashing into the target on the anode. So focusing cup takes it and shoots it to the anode. The collision creates heat and energy, and that the energy is what are x-rays. So the specific metal has electrons that instead of the metal melting, it just boils and the electrons boil off, hit a focusing uh, target, or this uh, focusing cup helps it to hit this target, and then this collides, creates heat and energy, and then we have a small window that allows those x-rays to leave the tube. I do have a video here. I have it pulled out for you on eLearn, so you can watch and see how that actually works. So I do want you to watch that video. It will make it a lot more clear. So this is what it looks like. So this big round cylinder here is allows this uh, uh, cylinder to um, turn and to, to boil up those electrons and then shoot it from that focusing cup um, on the negative side to the positive side, the anode. Um, and it's always uh, right side to left side. Um, so there's, there's one side that has the um, positive side, one side has the negative side. So the negative side of the, the x-ray tube is called the cathode. Okay? Um, one way to, to, for me to remember this, is, and, and this is not actually true, um, I have a twin sister, her name is Catherine, so we call her Kath. Um, and we, I just think, oh, well, Kath's always negative. She's not, and that's not true, but when I'm, that's one way to, that you can possibly remember that Kathy is always negative. Um, but anyway, cathode negative uh, side of the x-ray tube. Two coiled wire 
tungsten filaments. So there's your metal, tungsten. It's really important to remember what kind of metal that is because it's the only metal that will heat to the right amount to boil. Well, there are other metals, but this is the safest one uh, that is most usable. Boils off those electrons. Um, we have two sizes of these tungsten filaments, but that allows us, that if we have a smaller target, if we have a smaller animal, it allows us to use a smaller size. And if we have a higher um, target, then it allows us to use um, the, uh, the, the larger size. So that allows us to, to get a higher quality uh, x-ray if we have a smaller animal. And just remember, we are x-raying Great Danes or horses down to uh, chihuahuas or even smaller geckos. So having those two different sizes allows us to make some choices. Um, so we have the cathode, we have the tungsten filaments, two sizes, and we have the focusing cup that contains those filaments. Um, and then we have these two electrical cir circuits. Um, the high voltage electrical circuit that, circuit that comes in is our kilovoltage potential, KVP. This is your speed of electrons. And so it's really important for you to understand the difference between KVP or the speed of electrons and milliamperage, which is the low voltage uh, electrical circuits, which is the number of electrons. I'm not really sure how to help you remember that. It's going to be individual for you, but uh, maybe if you draw a NASCAR and you put KVP on the side of it, you can remember that's in charge. Kilovoltage is in charge of speed. And maybe if you remember that milliamperage or ma is in charge of number, man, M-A-N, man, maybe. Uh, milliamperage is in charge of the number of electrons. And so the speed of electrons is important, but the number of electrons is also important. And when we put the two together in a certain combination, it's going to give us the best way to get a picture. All right, so now we have a focal spot. So we talked about the cathode, the tungsten filaments, uh, the, the focusing spot, uh, and then we, and now we have the target, which is the focal spot. So we have the focusing cup that goes to the focal spot, which is the target. This is the anode, and it's also made of tungsten. The size of the anode is determined by the size of the electron beam, um, accelerating from the cathode to the anode. A small focal spot resulting from electrons from the small filament will produce higher quality images and the large focal spot resulting in electrons from the large filament can use higher tube current but will result in loss of detail. So if you are looking at x-rays of a horse versus say a small dog you will see that the horse x-rays look really fuzzy. Now, if you want to stop this right now, pause and go to Google and look up horse x-ray images and then look up Chihuahua x-ray images or even Great Dane x-ray images, you will see that you can see things clearly on those smaller um, images and, and it becomes fuzzier the bigger the animal is. And if we're looking at the abdomen or the thorax in comparison even to the extremities, um, that's also fuzzier than looking at the extremities. So if you even look at just this is a thorax of a Great Dane versus this is the carpus of a Great Dane, you will see that the, the larger focal spot um, will get through that thick thorax, but you'll get lower detail. Um, whereas if you're just focusing on uh, the smaller focal spot with the uh, with the extremity, that's going to be better detail, higher quality images. So the positive side of the x-ray tube, the electrons crash into that target, and we have two types of anodes. We might have a stationary anode or a rotating anode. And it just depends on the x-ray machine that you're using. The target area is angled slightly to allow x-rays to leave the tube through the window down below it and aids in creating a smaller, more compact, effective focal spot. So this, the, the more co uh, confined that focal spot is, the better detail you have. Okay, So we do have to remember that we always have the cathode on one side and the anode on the other side. And what this creates is somewhat of a, a what's called a heel effect. And so this is what we call an artifact or something that is created uh, just because things, this is the way things work, okay? If we always remember that this heel effect is there, then it will help us when we read x-rays to understand what we're seeing.
So it's related to the angle of the target area and the absorption of by the anode and the target area. What it means is the X-ray beam is more intense at the right side, on the cathode side, and the thickest part of the patient should always be placed toward the cathode side. And actually the cathode, I say it's kind of on the right, but it's actually back behind. Um, and so the um, when you look at an X-ray table, the cathode side is on this side and the anode side, anode side is on this side. So the heel effect is on the back side. The thickest part of the animal should always be put towards the back side uh, of the um, X-ray table. Okay, so the cathode side. Um, if you look at these beams, if you can see the yellow of these beams, you can see it's they're more concentrated here uh, at the back side of the cathode side. And it's just the way that the x-ray machine has to be made that you'll see that, the heel effect. All right, physics. I know you don't didn't take this course because you wanted to focus on physics, but we have to talk about physics. Energy packed in an extremely fast-moving electron stops abruptly on that target, and 99% of it is lost as heat, and less than 1% is converted to an x-ray. So it takes a lot of energy um, put into this just to convert one x-ray. There are two possible events as electrons approach. The incoming electrons, as they come in, can miss the target atoms and their orbital electrons, and they go back through the target, and they're absorbed in, by the backing or the lead. The incoming electrons could also interact with the electron cloud of atoms in the target material and produce the x-rays. So they either create heat or they produce x-rays. As they're creating x-rays, we try to focus those x-rays. We see this collimator, um, and if you've done the radiation safety, you know that this collimation reduces the number of x-rays that go through this machine to the target. Why is this important? Well, it reduces the amount of direct x-ray, but it also reduces the amount of scatter x-ray. And these are the dangerous uh, x-rays that can cause a lot of problems for you. Lower energy photons are produced when an x-ray beam passes through a body and its energy is diminished. So as this x-ray beam comes down, you can see that it will bounce off at different angles and then it's going to hit the bone and bounce on a different angle or it's going to hit the tissue and bounce off at a different angle. So it's going to bounce off at different parts on the body or when it hits the, the, um, the where the x-ray is received and digitized. Um, if you have this co no collimation, it's going to bounce off a lot more areas. You can see a lot more um, scatter radiation traveling up. So collimation reduces the scatter radiation. Scatter radiation is bad. It decreases film quality. So the more scatter radiation you have, the blurrier your, um, your x-ray will be. Um, the it increases radiation exposure to the animal and to you, and it contributes to film blackness or density, but not to the image. So you get reduced subject con contrast without getting better quality. All right, so here's an example of sc scatter radiation. So this is collimation opened all the way up, um, should be brought down to just here, um, and so what we see is, uh, and, and, and scatteration will also increase as we increase the energy. So it's not collimated properly. So we have it, it you can see it scattering here <coughs> and here. <clears throat> so you, this is creating an image that you can't see. Uh, we have increased kilovoltage, which is just, um, is the speed of the electrons moving through. We have a lot of thickness. This is a thick animal, um, and we're increasing the side of, size of the field. So this is all scatter radi radiation that does not give us a really good readable uh, x-ray. So with the x-ray equipment, we do have a table on which we position the animal. Uh, we have cassette holders. Uh, we have a control panel for our kilovoltage and our mil milliamperage, and then we also have exposure time. Now, milliamperage, the number of electrons, is always set with exposure time because it's milliamperage, the number of electrons, per millisecond. So how many electrons are set through, put through every millisecond? So it, it, we do it based on MAS dial, which is milliamperage plus time. 
this is a portable x-ray it has a stand we have a portable x-ray it's it doesn't it's not exactly like this but it looks a little like this um, it does not have a stand but we we hold it and it allows us to take x-rays at farms of uh, farm animals um, we we do hand hold it but we have to keep it very very still or we have to retake x-rays we don't like retaking x-rays so as much as possible we'd like to set it on a block or a stand sometimes that's not possible if you don't have a movable stand uh, that allows you to adjust in increments so uh, mobile x-rays are medium powdered, powered. Uh, they can be uh, wheel mounted. We also have a stationary x-ray in our classroom. It is not en energized, uh, energized, so we cannot produce x-rays from it, but we, uh, we can switch it to an energized if we put it in a room um, that is safe to put, take x-rays. That room is not safe to take x-rays in, so we don't do that. Um, the stationary ones tend to be more powerful. They have, they're bigger. Um, they are, uh, we don't move them, so they can be bigger. The x-ray tube could be suspended or attached to the floor or stand or from the ceiling, and it can rotate 90 degrees. So we can take an x-ray of an animal uh, looking down on it, or we can switch it so that we're looking sideways. So with horses, we'll take um, an x-ray, uh, you know, facing sideways instead of making them lie down on their side. So, okay, talking about exposure factors. So how do we, uh, why, how and why do we set the exposure time, the milliamperage and the kilovoltage, kilovoltage so KVP, MAS, how do we set that? Why do we do it? I'm also going to talk a little bit about focal film distance. We always, when we are uh, taking x-rays, we want to have that x-ray machine at the same distance away from the subject as much as possible. You can see this is always going to be at the same distance. Okay, This should be the same distance. You're not going to raise or lower this. There's no way to raise or lower this from the table. So we're going to be at the same distance. It's called the focal distance. And that allows us to focus uh, at, a, at a, a specific it reduces the, um, the the number of variables in how we're taking x-rays. Okay. Sorry. Find our spot. Okay. So our focal film distance typically is uh, about three feet um, or about um, 36 inches. Okay. Um, when we talk about intensifying screen and x-ray film, this is not systems. X-ray films are used when we would use cassettes that had film in it, and I will show you those at some point. They have film in it. We took it, the x-ray, and what the, the x-ray would do would be to expose the film around the body, and the more exposure to the film, the blacker that film would get. Anything that kept that film from being exposed would look white like bone. So the denser the, the um, tissue that you're going through, the brighter it is, the whiter it is, because the film is not being exposed. So it's kind of like a negative of, if you've ever seen a negative of a picture, that's what it is. What you're seeing is the negative of the exposure. So you're exposing the, the tissue to x-ray, the x-rays are going through either through the tissue, bouncing off the tissue, or going directly to the film. And if it's going directly to the film, that film turns black. If it doesn't turn black, that means it had to go through something, something dense. And the different densities uh, will show you uh, you know, some, some changes in the uh, x-rays. So gray to white to black is what we're looking at. When we talk about tabletop versus grid, in the table of the x-ray machine, there is a vibrating, typically a vibrating grid that will vibrate when you take an x-ray. What that grid does is stop the scatter radiation, or it focuses the scatter radiation onto the plate so you get a much more clear x-ray even if you have a thick animal. If you're doing a tabletop x-ray, you're doing it on a extremity or a limb or a small animal. Um, a small animal does not need the grid because we don't need to focus, we don't need to use high energy x-rays, we don't need to focus that scatter uh, um, 
scatter radiation as much. So tabletop would be for smaller animals or smaller things we're taking x-rays of, and grid or uh, under the table cassettes would be for larger animals, larger body parts. All right, here's some examples. So um, when we're setting up an animal on, for an x-ray, we're going to decide, first of all, are we going to put the x-ray cassette on the table or underneath the table? Um, if we're going to put the x-ray cassette and whether it's film or it's digitized, uh, a computerized um, cassette, um, we can make that decision. Um, if, we're, if we're doing a joint, a smaller joint, um, we're going to do it um, not with a grid. Okay, this is this happens to be a horse uh, joint, so we're not going to we're going to just use the cassette anyway. There's no grid when you're X-raying at the joint of a horse. Milliampere, remember, it controls the quantity or number of electrons boiled off of the filament in the X-ray tube. It controls the amount of X-rays that will be produced at the target area. If we increase or decrease, it will cause a similar correlative effect in density. So milliampere, or number of electrons, controls density. This is underexposed. Do you see how dense that bone is? That's really dense. It's very bright. That means that we have um, uh, x-rays that are exposing the film or the digitized section of the cassette, but not this area where it's really dense. So it's not strong enough. There are not enough of those um, electrons to get through this dense tissue, this bone. Okay, So this is underexposed. This is overexposed. There, if this is too black. You can't even see the soft tissue. Here you can see a lot of soft tissue. Here you can see a little bit of soft tissue. You cannot see the soft tissue. You can only see bone and you can pretty much see through the bone. Okay, little bit too much. That is overexposed. Your MAS is high. This year MAS is low. So it controls density. This is ideal exposure. You can see a little bit of soft tissue, some grayness. You can see tendons up here. You can see the bone. You can almost see the bone marrow, the, the spicules of the bone within the bone um, itself. And this area here, it's dark, but it's not black. Okay. Or not black like here. It's not too white like here. Okay. So that's what we're looking at. Um, over, underexposed, too dense, underexposed, overexposed, not dense enough. Exposure time is fractions of milliseconds, fractions of a second. It's the time during which the anode is positively charged. The longer the exposure time, the greater number of electrons can flow from the cathode to the anode. So if you think about it, this is a, a long exposure time, taking a picture with a long exposure time. Things are blurry, right? You see a lot of lights, but they're all blurry because you're opening the, the, the lens for a long period of time. You can't see individual details. You just see a lot of movement, and that movement turns into blur. So the lot of, lot of x-rays during that time, um, but you get, you're going to get a blurry effect. So if we can lower, we want to do the highest milliampere we can, the greatest number of um, electrons in the lowest exposure time to minimize blur, especially if we have an animal that might be moving. And moving means even breathing. So breathing can change the expo uh, what we see on an x-ray. If you're doing an x-ray of a thorax, that's going to change the way you set your MAS because you want to decrease your exposure time significantly. So your, your settings for a thorax should be very different from your settings for an abdomen where the abdomen remains still most of the time. All right, kilovoltage is the energy or the speed of the x-ray beam. The voltage differential, and there's a scale of contrast. The KVP setting must be high enough to penetrate the patient, but not so high as to decrease the contrast. So milliampere or the number of electrons is about density. Exposure time is about how clear that x-ray is, especially with movement. is about contrast okay so this is a high kvp we have low radiographic contrast so a high kvp means that you have a lot of energy of x-rays going through um, but you have um, low contrast okay so there's not a lot of difference between soft tissue and bone with a low kvp 
you have a slower speed of the electrons going through. Um, so they're taking their time going through, but you have a high radiographic contrast. So you have very little difference, uh, um, or you, have, um, you can't see the soft tissue as much. Focal film distance, this is the distance between the um, target in the x-ray tube and the surface of the x-ray detector. Um, we talk about in centimeters, I give you in inches. Um, it's normally a constant from one exposure to another. So we typically do it at 70 to 85 centimeters for large animals and 90 to 105 centimeters for small animals. Constancy from one exposure to another is essential. And that's why when we put it at a distance, we mark that distance and we keep it at that distance. Any increase in that distance is going to decrease the number of x-rays non-proportionally. There's an inverse square law that's associated with that. So we want to try to keep that as steady as possible. With the grids, like I said, it's a grid um, that controls scatter radiation before it reaches the x-ray cassette. Uh, so it's between the body of the animal and the um, x-ray cassette, and it's usually contained within a table. Uh, it's constructed of a sheet of lead strips interfaced with radiolucent spacers made of a plastic or aluminum. That means that light will go through them. Um, it requires greater exposure to produce radiograph of acceptable density, uh, most useful when obtaining x-rays of the thickest part of the body. So greater than 10 centimeters thick, you're going to put the x-ray under the, under the, in, the, um, in the cassette holder under the table uh, where the it has to go through the grid. We develop uh, in our, our program, we help you to understand how to develop a technique chart. Um, it used to be that you had to do this. Now with a computerized system, um, it's not, it, we have our, our technique chart is contained within the computer system. Um, but what this does is to help us be consistent in our x-ray imagery. And it, every machine is going to be different, and so it has to be developed for that machine. There are some standardized factors. Um, we typically do it based on a kilovoltage technique chart. Um, we don't adjust MAS very uh, frequently, just the KVP based on size. Um, size and body part. So if we're doing um, head or spine versus thorax versus abdomen versus extremity, we're going to have different settings based on size. Um, and typically when we develop it, we develop it based on trial and error exposures. We're going to take a, a, a known size of um, uh, usually a model and measure it and we're going to take an x-ray of it and then adjust it up and down based on uh, how we're seeing the outcome. Okay, real briefly, digitized radiography, much more common uh, to see these days used in veterinary medicine. We can use digital fluoroscopy, which is a moving x-ray, which is great when you're trying to look at things moving through the GI tract or through the kidneys. Um, computed tomography, which is a CT scan, uh, which is a 3D x-ray basically. Diagnostic ultrasound, very common um, when you're using um, sound waves in order to visualize uh, what's happening within typically a fluid environment doesn't work really well in an air environment because it bounces back. Nuclear medicine is when you inject the animal with uh, nuclear material and you follow that nuclear material through the body. Uh, magnetic re uh, resonance imaging or MRI um, is using magnets to visualize the body. <clears throat> Digital radiography is what we're using or computed radiography. Um, Digital is all digital computed is taking something and turning it into uh, digital. Um, and that's what the, the type of x rays that is just commonplace these days. Um, more information on that is going to, we're going to talk about that later. And if you are curious, and I invite you to stay curious, you can push this button that will take you uh, to that section in this lecture. We do have the ability to take our digital Im imaging and uh, save it as a um, digital file. And then we can take that and we can send it to a radiologist, somebody who looks at these images all the time, who can give us a better idea of what we're looking at. And th that's something I absolutely recommend that um, especially new technicians or new veterinarians take part in. It helps, it, it, it helps you to educate yourself um, to see some of these things um, 
Um, there's also something called the Picture Archival Computing Systems called PAX, which is where we can move images between different computer workstations within a single hospital or even between hospitals. It helps us to store image data permanently and put it into medical records. Um, uh, so that can be really important too. So DICOM and PACS are important. Uh, radiology information systems and teleradiology, much more common um, using software programs that coordinate that patient data. We can put it into their medical record. And then teleradiology allows us to get these uh, images to specialists and then have them interpret them and get them back to us uh, pretty quickly. Film systems. So this is kind of dinosaur of the past. Um, when I started, I started with dip tanks where I would have to take um, x-rays that had been exposed um, through the uh, x-ray machine, take it into a dark room. You would normally not be able to see this. Put it into the uh, fixed bath and then the water bath and then we put it into the uh, um, developer so we develop it fix it water rinse and dryer for uh, you had to set a timer and when the timer got off seven minutes of my life spent in a dark room um, doing each x-ray so it can take a long time this is an automatic processor it's been uncovered so you can see that you insert films it goes through a developer through a fixer through the water rinse into a dryer and in it within a minute and a half you've got your x-ray for going from a dip tank to an automatic processor was like oh my gosh my life has so greatly improved going from an automatic processor to a computerized system is amazing as well because within three seconds you have the picture that you need to see and you don't have to store these films or pick the right film for the right um, image, uh, etc. Or worry about how people are cleaning the cassettes or putting uh, film in the cassettes so they're not being exposed. Um, lots of problems uh, with using uh, film and automatic processors, etc. Uh, that we just don't have with computerized systems. So again, we have lots of different systems like ultrasound, computed tomography, fluoroscopy, nuclear medicine, MRI. We're going to discuss those in another course. If you have any questions about any of these, um, if you are still curious, you can move forward uh, through this um, uh, lecture, through your chapter. We will be covering some of this stuff later. Um, things that I'm going to be um, questioning you about will be in this lecture itself, but bring your questions to class, please.